<laughs> I know that's we not have true. been a real supporter of the historical society for years and years. And I also know that he wears many, many hats. We know him as a musician. We know him as a uh, instructor. We know him as a... Yeah, but, yeah, but, uh, someone told me you were a machinist. I was for uh, 10 years, yeah. And we know he that naturally is an instructor at Radford and University. And with all these, the author part of him is what we're going to be learning about today, probably mixed in with the others too. But a uh, man of, of all kinds of talents and honors, and we know him as one of our legends in Floyd County for his <laughs> history knowledge and being able to ex explain it and relate it in books and in stories and in word and speeches. Is that you? Um, uh, sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're just so happy you could take time today to find, uh, to come with us and we're looking forward to learning more about your book and Anything you want to tell us? Oh, well, you be careful there. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, if, if we don't need this, we won't use it. But do we need, do we need a, a microphone here? We do? Okay. Um, well, uh, thank you, Becky. Gosh, that's, uh, I think I'll just retire right now. Uh, that was a very generous and warm introduction. Uh, Be Becky said I was a legend in Floyd. I've... Uh, I teach a class in folklore, and uh, the definition, one de uh, a requirement to be a legend is that at some point in time, someone believed it, but it isn't necessarily true. So, <laughs> and that's what distinguishes a legend from a folktale. A folktale, no one ever believed it, but in this case, the two are pretty similar. But um, it's great to be here and uh, to support the Historical Society. They do great work. And we're lucky in Floyd to have three organizations and they have a lot of overlap but we have the historical society which is visible they've got the great exhibit right there go see that things made of wood uh if you're open are you open today becky yeah uh, they will be at 12. go to, on your way home go see that. i'll make sure they stay here till 12 and then they'll have to go <laughs> see that and uh and also the old church gallery is um wears a lot of hats you know they're they're obviously supportive of visual arts and crafts, uh, but they also have a historical uh, interest, and they have a really, really good exhibit on baskets down there now, and you ought to see that. Some of those baskets are almost like needlework, like these beautiful quilts. Uh, the, the weaving of the baskets is just so far beyond what was necessary to make them function. It's just really, it is really fine art, so you ought to see that too. And then there's the, the Historical Preservation Trust, which is a, a sort of a background group and uh, they own and restored the, the Williams House for the benefit of the Historical Society. So you've got three active groups here in a pretty small county, so that's great. Uh, before we start this, or as we start it, I want to be sure to, uh, to, uh, to mention and remind everyone that I'm not the sole author of this book. Uh, I saw an ad in the Roanoke Times that said his book and Becky just said his book and uh, I'm doing the talking about the book, and I'm flattered to be associated with it, but I, I don't want anyone to forget uh, or, or, or to make sure you know that Franklin Fitzgerald Webb, this fine fella here, started this book back in the 80s sometime. And uh, Frank was uh, born in Floyd County. He was, his uncle, uh, um, Oscar Ames Webb, was... Uh, the man who owned Webb's Mill down here on Route 8 for years and years, Frank and Luther Webb. Many of you knew Luther were first cousins. And in fact, Frank's father was Luther. Uh, and Luther, our Luther here, was named after Frank's dad. Frank and his three brothers were born up at the headwaters of Howell Creek, um, uh, up there near where uh, Fairview Church, uh, up that road. And uh, his father died young. They went to Roanoke, and he was raised in Roanoke. But he... He uh, always came back to Floyd, and he was uh, two things. He was a great talker, and he was an avid trout fisherman, and those two things allowed him to, to find all these mills. And I spoke on the phone with Frank's widow. Frank's been dead for 22 years. I spoke with his widow uh, one night this last week to invite her to come. She's 86, and she didn't think she would make it, but 
Um, I asked her how did Frank find all those meals. And she said, I don't know, I just know he was gone all the time. And uh, she was a meal widow. Uh, forget about golf and all that stuff. Um, but um, since Frank died, that's 22 years ago, uh, when he handed over to me his notes for this book, and we, I met Frank in 1992, and at that time he was already uh, pretty far along with the brain cancer that it was uh, it was operated on a couple of times but they could never get it all and uh, did any of you all know Frank some of you surely knew Frank where yes yeah you knew Frank yeah. but but how many other people here no one that's right he's your cousin yeah. now Frank was a tough guy and I'm, 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 I'm taking up our time here but it's worth mentioning that Frank was a veteran of World War two he was in the US Navy and uh, came home, on the, went on the GI Bill, I guess, to college in Michigan, came back to Roanoke and worked for, uh, uh, he put, installed uh, substations for, uh, I guess, APCO for years and years. But he was a tough guy, and uh, he went to, if you've ever, any of you ever read deeds in the courthouse for more than 15 minutes at a time, you know why they don't give you chairs to sit in, because you'd be asleep in those chairs. And uh, Frank did that for what must have amounted to two years uh, reading. And if you've ever gone back past 1915 to 10 and read the handwritten deeds, they're beautiful, but you can't read them. It's that copper plate and it's just gorgeous, but try to read it. And uh, Frank did that, uh, which is amazing. And then, but the most amazing thing is that he found more than 140 mills. And uh, since he died, I know about, I have, I have learned about one meal that exists only hearsay, and it's in the book. And since the book came out, um, I've learned about one meal that is documented, that it absolutely exists. So, so in 22 years, one meal that he didn't know about. And uh, that, that is the most amazing thing that anybody I know has ever done. How he found those is just, it's amazing. So if it weren't for Frank Webb, this book would be about this thick. And if it weren't for my wife, it would be in here and not on this table here. So um, it's uh, people to thank there. But Frank is an amazing guy. I wish you could have known him. And I'm so proud that his work is, is here. If he's not, his work is still here. So that's Frank. And um, this is a, a map that is kind of useless, but it's, art, it's decorative. This, this has 140 mils, and um, yes. Oh, there we go. Uh, thank you, John. Um, so um, it's, you wouldn't use this to go find these mills, but it gives you a visual image of how many were the density of them. You see some, what do they call them now, food deserts? We have mill deserts in Floyd County. There, there's places where there, there weren't any mills, and that suggests to me that maybe they just weren't known about, because mills were like uh, schoolhouses in a way. You, if you got, whether you got, if you got kids, they need to go to school, and if you, whether you've got kids or not, people need to eat. So, so mills tended to be um, distributed where there was a demand. So, um, and these are located by the stream. If you're interested in where the mills are, the book has them by a stream, but also with mileages on the, the nearest roads. Most of them are on roads that still exist. And um, let's see, I can see this here. Uh, so the, the book is set up by, in fourths by, it's, the county is not evenly, but it's logically broken up by routes eight and 221. So uh, that's how the book is arranged. Uh, the most famous mill in Floyd County is Mabry Mill. And I always like to take a little bit of dig at Mabry Mill, and um, academics always like to 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 uh, to make a little fun of people who have to um, dress things up to make them more attractive. And um, the 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 pond you see in front of the mill that's a pond, and the mill that's behind it is a mill, but that's not a mill pond. <laughs> uh, why is that not a mill pond? The Park Service built it, but why can't it be a mill pond no matter who built it there? The, yeah, the, the water has to be at a higher elevation. You can't stand there with a the bucket and pour it on the wheel. Now you could, but that sort of defeats the purpose of the whole thing. 
So that's beautiful. And officially, the, the mill, uh, the Park Service calls that a reflecting pool. <laughs> so they don't claim it's a mill pond, but they let you think it is. Uh, but, but to their credit, uh, without something like that that makes it a, attractive, a, a picturesque spot, then they wouldn't have the money and, or what little they do have to, to maintain those things. It costs a lot of money to keep up a wooden water wheel. If you ever want to build a water wheel, I know you're probably going to start one as soon as you leave here. Today. <laughs> Don't build it out of wood because it will rot. It won't stay in balance and it won't last. Build it out of, build it out of steel or aluminum or fiberglass or something like that. Uh, but uh, Mabry Mill is uh, authentic except for that and there's uh, some other things were, were changed but it is a typical mill that what we think of and that is the most common type of mill that existed in Floyd County. When you see a mill that's only one story it probably ground only corn and it ground uh, feed for a chop, uh, you know, animal feed, chicken, crack corn for chickens and so on, but did not make flour, possibly made uh, buckwheat flour, which was ground on stones as long as uh, it was being made. But uh, most of those mills you, see, you saw on that map, the biggest part of them were uh, small mills like that, and they ground cornmeal, and people would typically go one day a week uh, walk, put a, a turn, you take a turn to the mill, and the turn is typically half a bushel. A bushel is 56 pounds, and a half a bushel is 28, and that, you put that in a sack and put that over your shoulder. If you got a horse, you, you tie the sack and you divide it so that a little hangs on each side of the horse, and you take that to the mill, or you put your kid on the horse with the sack and tell them not to let it fall off, because what are they going to do? And um, I've heard Several stories, and other people have told me stories of older folks who were sent to the mill by their dads with a sack of corn and uh, scared to death all the time that it would slide off the horse and how would they get it back on. And uh, one of my uncles told me that that happened to him, and he said the horse was patient and they had it kind of trained, and he said he got the horse to, to lay down in the ditch, and he dragged the corn up on the bank and got it on the back of the horse, got the horse up, and got on the bank, jumped on the horse, and off he went to the mill. Uh, so these were very common and um, they are the ones that are most likely dis to disappear completely. Uh, here's a couple more examples. This was the Ace of Short Jake Brogan Mill. There's a book of uh, uh, Franklin County, pictorial history of Franklin County that includes that mill, which implies that it's in Franklin County, but it's actually in Floyd County. And uh, other people have tried to steal Mabry Mill from us too, you know. Um, there, uh, did any of you all know Phil Gettle, Phil Gettle Philip Gettle? You, of course you did, Judy, yeah. Phil Gettle owned uh, the Schuler Mill down there. Well, I guess his daughter does now, maybe. And he, I haven't looked at it in years, but he had a collection of postcards, and I think it was more than 20 different states that had a postcard that shows Mabry Mill. <laughs> And it doesn't say, come to Iowa and see Mabry Mill, but it says, visit Iowa, and there's, it sort of implies that, doesn't it? <laughs> but you're gonna spend a long time in Iowa before you find Mabry Mill. Uh, but you spend the money, buy gas, eat food, so they get what they want. Yeah, so, um, so it's, it's iconic. If, if, everything is, if anything was ever an icon or iconic, then Mabry Mill is it. And, uh, but there are other mills quite similar. Here's one, uh, this would be, obviously near the Franklin and Floyd County line. Uh, uh, this one was up on uh, Rush Fork, the Ace of Pratt Mill, another uh, one-story mill. Um, no sign of it now, but a little bit of the race. And uh, those mills typically did not, uh, if you went in, if you were a, a thief uh, and wanted to rob someone, you would be wasting your time to go to one of these mills because all you could get was some corn because they didn't handle any money. You could say, go in there and give me all your money. There isn't any. Uh, you take this uh, larger container, that's a half a bushel, and you take that to the mill, and he takes out one-eighth of that. So out of a, a bushel is eight gallons, a half is four. So one-eighth of that is one-half of a gallon. So the miller takes his toll. He's taking a toll, a T-O-L-L. And uh, with that, he can make it into cornmeal for his own use. Uh, I know some of you are interested in the liquor trade in a, in a purely academic way. And um, 
that it was a good, uh, you know, that was legal at one time. And even after it wasn't legal, uh, many, uh, well, I'll say some, people who were involved in the middle of the business were also involved in the liquor business and people, and the other way around, people who were interested in the liquor business got involved in the milling business because it was a source of corn and it was also a way to be grinding a lot of corn if, if nobody wondered why you were doing that. <laughs> so so it's, um, it's a natural combination. It's a, and, and also many people who were in the milling business uh, grew hogs because same thing, you got some, some bad grain. And actually, they, eventually they had to pass a law that said you could not keep hogs in the same yard with your meal. Because for one thing, you would think it wouldn't be too good for customer relations, but there was a sanit sanitary thing, you know, all that mud and the creek. So you had to have a fence lot uh, of X acres so far away from your meal. So those two things kind of ran together. But the small mills, mostly grinding corn, and uh, you take that over there every week. And some people could eat that much in a week. I talked to a fellow who had eight brothers and sisters, and he said they ate a half a bushel of corn every week. They ate cornmeal probably twice a day. They probably had mush for breakfast. And, and uh, if they ever had a holiday, they probably had corn dogs or something like that. So um, corn chips, I don't know. But corn is, corn is uh, you know, we are corn-fed people. Uh, I recommend to you a really good, uh, a documentary called King Corn. And in this documentary, two young men from uh, Harvard or somewhere went and had their, they had their hair analyzed. And they said, said we are mostly corn because half the stuff we get from uh, stores is, uh, has got corn products in it some way. Um, so I don't wanna get too far. This is corn meal, of course, coming out. And it's a good picture because you can see in it the little flecks of that little outer covering. And I, I could, I gotta remind myself to stay on task here because I don't wanna get off to talk about the differences in corn and, and wheat, but one important difference in corn and wheat is this. Uh, if, if you are the poorest of the poor people, what you grow is corn because it, corn yields more per acre. If you take 56 pounds of corn to the mill, to the mill to have it ground into meal, you get back more than 50 pounds. You get 52, three, four pounds because all that's lost is that thin, waxy, you know, when you make popcorn, that little hard, translucent part, that's all you lose. But if you take uh, wheat to the mill, you have 60 pounds as a bushel, you get back maybe 40 pounds of flour. You get bran and you get middlings, which is what uh, they used to feed the hogs. Uh, some of you have been around, you remember Daisy Middlings and Red Dog and stuff like that. It's a little bit yellow. People did not want yellow flour, they wanted white flour. So they, it's an ironic thing. They took this really nutritious yellow flour and with, the, with the germ and the oil and all the protein and they fed that to their hogs. And then they took the white stuff and, and made biscuits and fed to their children. And uh, which has to have uh, enriched bread that you buy. When, they, when it says enrich flour, they don't enrich it because they're doing you a favor. They enrich it because it's no good if they don't do that. All, all the good's been taken out of it. So back on topic here. It may be one o'clock, Becky, before they get down there. <laughs> uh, all right, now this is, the, this is what you think of when you think of the big flour mill. And they were typically multi-story, often three-story. And the reason is very simple for that. Uh, if you're handling a lot of wheat, you have to, it has to be cleaned uh, several times, and it has to be sifted. Typically, the, the, the mills that made uh, cornmeal, they didn't even sift it for you. They, they were minimal. They ground it. You got everything back except your toll, and then you took it home and you sifted it. But the flour mill is much more complex. They had to clean the wheat when it comes in. And once again, you want that, that uh, flour to be white and pure, so you clean the cockles and weed seeds and everything out of it uh, before you mill it, and then you run it through a sifter multiple times because you have to get the most flour. And uh, if you read the deeds on these things, you'll see that these big flour mills often changed hands frequently because people went broke frequently. The profit margin on those things was so slim, and uh, it, a, a miller had to get every ounce of flour that he could out of a bushel of wheat to make a profit on it, because he was not dealing in trade, he was dealing in money. And uh, these big mills, they had to sell flour to make, to make a living. It wasn't just a custom trade. And uh, this one was down toward Indian Valley. Notice the date on it, it's 1902 to the 1940s. 
that's really the, the heyday of the big flour mill. Some of you know that Floyd County's population was about 15,000 in 1900, and it began to decline, and it declined through the 60s, and it started picking back up, and now it's probably back above 15,000, but most of those 15,000 aren't raising wheat and flour uh, and corn mills, so we don't need the mills anymore, but uh, the, the, most of the mills were built, the big mills were built around 1900 when people, Floyd County was agriculture, it was, it was it, we didn't know it yet, but it, we thought it was still growing, we didn't know that it was not. So that's a typical, so uh, you have to have those three stories because you have to elevate that flour and wheat back to the top floor so it can feed by gravity through all those machines, that's why they're so tall. And along the par parallel to that ridge pole, that ridge line of that mill, that um, uh, the upper story, you'd have a big line shaft with dozens of pulleys on it, connected to every machine in the top floor. You'd have a shaft on the second floor, and then you have the the main gears in the basement, and that's that's what transmits all that power. So that's why you have those multiple stories for all those machines, uh, for power transmission, and also to store the grain because people would bring corn to the mill, get it ground, take it home. There's no need for storage, but with a wheat mill, you gotta have those big bins. Some farmers would bring their wheat and leave it, and you would pay you a little to store it, and the uh, millers would buy wheat to grind for people who weren't producing their own. So much more complex buildings, much more expensive, and um, much more, uh, a greater investment and, and more risk of loss with those. And uh, another one, notice the date, 1910 to 1946. Uh, this was down on Big Indian Creek. If, you've ever, if you ever knew where Evie Shelton's store was at down on the Copper Valley, uh, at the bottom of White Rock Road, this was just up the road. It's a curve up there. A lot of people fish up there still, and that mill was, was built there in 1910, and it was torn down in 46. And uh, uh, World War II is the key thing. World War II really changed uh, people's habits. It put money in circulation so that people didn't have to grow and make everything they ate and wore. And uh, it put people on the roads. I'm already in Radford. I'm working at the Burlington Mill. I'm working at uh, I'm working at uh, N and W in Roanoke. I'm working at uh, the Foundry. I'm working at the Arsenal. I'm going right by a store. Why do I? Why am I going to put out a field of wheat and take a chance on getting it to grow? Uh, Effie Brown, I know some of you knew Effie Brown. She, she could date, I guess she could date everything that ever happened to her, but she said 1926 was the first time she saw a, a loaf of bread from the store. And they thought it was the most wonderful thing. And um, little did they know what they were getting, but, uh, um, but it, was, you know, it was a great treat. And uh, you, you've heard people talk about carrying lunch to school and the kids who were ashamed because they had biscuits and their classmates had that, had that light red. And uh, they didn't wonder why their classmates were so skinny, because they weren't getting any nutrition out of that. But Okay, uh, this is a roller mill. There's nothing, uh, if you get a, uh, uh, a millstone, people are crazy for those things, and they want to stick them out beside their driveway, because who's going to steal it? And uh, if someone, if you see someone picking up a millstone or taking it away, don't chase him, let him go. <laughs> Because you don't want to fool with that guy. Um, millstones today, you can a thousand bucks or something for a, for the big forty inch millstone. These are worth scrap prices, but they are far superior to a millstone because simply they make more flour, they make it faster, and that's the, it's a bottom line profit margin thing. But there's no romance to them. Uh, the the rollers in them are are grooved steel, uh, belt driven, and um, this one, we were taking it out of the Spangler mill down there. It had four stands, and as you can see, you got to have at least two. Uh, each, uh, each side of that thing actually has two rollers, so you can run grain through that thing twice. It comes in the top and goes this way. It goes through, it comes out the bottom, goes through a hole in the floor, down to the basement. There's an elevator, takes it all the way to the top floor again. It's a, it's a, a wooden chute with a, a canvas belt with uh, cups, metal cups, riveted to that belt. It just lifts it up to the top floor, and when it goes over the top of that pulley, it dumps out into another chute. Down it comes to the next, uh, side, to the other side of that thing. So uh, that's roller milling in a nutshell. But 
you never, I've never seen one of those sitting with a mailbox on top of it. So, um, but I'll tell you what, if someone runs into it, they won't knock your mailbox down. Because those things are heavy. Uh, uh, by the state, by state law, you take a half a bushel of your corn to the mill, you get, uh, you give the guy a half a gallon and you get the rest of it. Uh, flower rates were also set by law, but they varied. They varied with the, with the economy. They go up and down during wars and so on. So this is a, the millinage, I don't know how you say that, millinage table that uh, would sort that out. And if you have a question about that, uh, there's at least one miller here. Gene Vaughn is here, uh, one of our last millers, and he could probably tell you something about that. But it's a, you can see that it's, it's not as complex as it looks because it gives you different amounts. It's not a different calculation for each line, but it's much more complex than taking out a one-eighth and giving the guy the rest of it back. And, uh, and as I said, that could change uh, with the economy. Uh, who's eating all this flour and meal? Um, this is my mom's family in 1948. My mom had, uh, my mom's here, she had one brother and 10 sisters. And uh, their dad was a farmer and they all worked on the farm and they, they grew wheat every year and they took it to the mill, they grew corn. Um, you gotta hoe the corn three times. Every person I've talked to who's, who's just a little older than I am who grew up on, uh, a farm pre, uh, what do they call those things? Weed, uh, plant, insecticides and what's the herbicides? Before those things, before no-till planting, you put that corn out as soon as you can get it out. And uh, what's, um, someone said when, uh, when an oak leaf is as big as a squirrel's ear, that's when it's time to plant, the, to plant corn. If you can catch a squirrel to compare, to see. Um, you get it out as soon as you can, and, you, and it's got to be knee-high by the 4th of July, or it's not going to make a good crop. And everyone I ever talked to said, you've got to hoe it three times. And uh, most people could put out between 5 and 10 acres. And it all depends on how, how many kids you had, how much corn you could, you could grow. So um, you, you hoe it three times, and it was a, a pretty awful thing. And uh, by the 4th of July, that was your last time, and you had it laid by, and then you could go out and play once in a while. Um, when you say it's a tough row to hoe, I'm sure they were talking about corn <laughs> or cotton. This is another family, more typical. 12 was, 12 was not unheard but heard of, but it was pretty unusual. This is a family with one, two, three, four, five, six kids, much more typical, also from Indian Valley. And then this is my dad's family, but they're not all there. His, uh, his uh, oldest brother was in service, and uh, his, no, I guess that's, and one sister had left home and was living in Radford. So that's, he, my dad and uh, nine of his uh, 11 siblings. And uh, by that time, his father had died, and uh, they, they weren't farming, but her brother <clears throat> was a, Let's see, her brother-in-law, Jean's dad, was a miller, and uh, they owned a threshing machine, and they would rent that out, and people would thresh, and they would get some grain in that way. So even if people weren't farming, they were counting on flour and cornmeal. Uh, this is corn planted in the old way. Today, corn is planted about this far apart, and it's about eight inches apart. But pre-fertilizer, corn was planted three feet apart. The rows were three feet apart. And uh, in the earliest days, early 20th century, it was, it was in hills three feet apart. And out in the Midwest, they would plow it in both directions. They'd plow it this way, and then they'd turn and go 90 degrees and plow it the other way. But if you've been in Floyd more than an hour, you know you can't do that here. You, you plow it one way, or you may have to hoe it. You can't, maybe can't even plow it. But uh, they were, many of the fields that have now grown up in this second growth uh, timber were cornfields, and they put out corn in some really remarkably steep places because they could not, this could not grow enough corn. Uh, in the 19, early 30s, 25 bushels an acre was a pretty good yield of corn. And um, I could take up your time talking about how far you walk to do that and how much time you spend, but it's, it's tremendous labor just to get that, to have some cornbread to eat, tremendous amount of labor. And we'll see a picture later, you'll see some cornfields in the background. 
uh, corn shocks. It was harvested, uh, the field corn or the, the bread corn was uh, shocked. And uh, you just, the only place you see those now is in front of some convenience store with pumpkins stacked around it. And um, there's a lot of S words in corn, uh, shock, shuck, shell, and maybe some others in there. But the first thing you do is shock it. And there's, a, there's a, not a science, but there's a lot of knowing how to doing that. How do you, know, how do you get the shocks to stand up and then you, you have to go back and shuck the corn and so on. So uh, the uh, wheat was also shocked. And I've never seen one of them in a convenience store. I guess they're harder to get. But uh, we, uh, we remember wheat in our language, but even that's dying out. If, if I didn't shave for a couple of days, I might have a stubble, a beard. And wheat, that's wheat stubble is what we're talking about. Or I might have, if I was a younger man, I might have a shock of hair on my head. I mean, I still have enough hair, plenty. But uh, you know what I'm talking about, that big thing it's almost unmanageable uh, people would call it a shock of hair because that reminds them of um, a, a shock of wheat or something like or, or corn now, this is 1984 this was Lee Huff's cornfield and I had just bought a 35 millimeter camera and and I didn't know it then but that was the last time I would ever see a field of shocked corn Lee Huff was an old farmer he did things the old way and uh, these are shocks of corn standing in his field out on Max Mountain Road at Indian Valley, and I think somebody's built a house there now, so uh, things have changed. Uh, and he, he puts that in a shop, and then he waits till on up in the fall, cold weather, he pushes those things over one at a time, and he, he shocks the corn. And then the shock would go to be stacked, to be fed to cattle, because back in the day when he was a young man, it was impossible to put up a lot of hay. So people, instead of chopping up the fodder and spreading it all over your field as mulch or um, whatever the right term for that would be, people saved the fodder and fed it to their, they fed it off a fodder stack. They fed it to their cattle in the wintertime. And this is what they were growing. This is white corn. And uh, nobody in Floyd County grows white corn than I know anymore, but uh, 60 years ago, everybody grew white corn. Some of you are from places outside Floyd County where, where you don't know that you should eat only white corn for cornbread. Uh, there, there are places in the Midwest, the, the South, where yellow corn is the standard. And um, I used to go down to Ferrum Folklife Festival. Well, uh, for, I went for years and years, but a few years I took a meal down there and ground corn meal. And, um, went broke like all the other millers did but um, but it was fun and uh, you could you could almost draw a line down the uh, 220 that divides Franklin County through Rocky Mount people west of 220 want white cornmeal people east of uh, that want uh, and they don't say corn they say cornmeal they said you have any yellow cornmeal and the people west would say, do you have any white corn meal? Because you know people uh, in Appalachia like R's. We like the letter R. And uh, we put it in words that really don't have it. Um, like wash, wash, and winder, and tomato, and tater, and things like that. So, uh, and I think that's because we are more frugal than those other people. <laughs> If they decide they don't need those R's, they're going to say con and yalla and all those words. We'll take those R's and we'll make some use out of them. We'll, <laughs> we'll put them into words. So that, that, there you go. Uh, corn, but, but today, I think people from Floyd County still look for white cornmeal when they go to the store and buy it. And um, the only difference, uh, I've, I have eaten yellow cornmeal. To me, it, ta it, it tastes a little strong. I don't uh, think it's as good as white. I've also been told, and I, I can think of no scientific reason, but I've told that white corn, there's a little bit more liquor in white corn. Uh, <laughs> but, I, you know, that's just probably a rumor, hearsay. Who knows? But um, that's the old open pollinated. You kept your seed, you planted it every year, and you don't eat your seed corn because you got to save a little to plant the next year. Uh, corn had a social side to it. Corn shuckings, you've heard about. These fellows were joined up for a corn shucking, and... Uh, if any of you are interested in that Hillsville Courthouse tragedy of 1912, one of the theory is that the whole thing started with a dispute, a romantic uh, dispute but over a romance uh, to, that happened at a corn shocking. So who knows about that? But corn shockings were, were it's, a, it's, a, it's an example of a working where you invite your neighbors to come 
and do a task that's just overwhelming alone, but if you get some people together, you can make a game out of it, and you can have some fun. You feed them afterward, you, you have a dance, and so on. And um, so that's the social side to that, that we've lost. Uh, mills were gathering places. This was Spangler Mill. Some of you probably saw it before. The wind blew it down in, I forget the date, 2005 maybe. Uh, it was one of the older mills in the county. Some people think that mill goes back to the 1700s. There was a mill there in the 1700s, but I'm pretty sure that that was the second mill there. But it did probably go back to the 1840s, so it was quite, quite old. Um, and you see that it was a, a gathering place for people. There was a sawmill there. I think there was a blacksmith stock store there, shop. And the first court in Floyd County took place at Spangler Mill on Pine Creek. And then somebody in Floyd paid a lot of money and they moved it up here. I'm just sure that's how that happened. I don't know. Uh, and waited for the railroad, which never got here. So <laughs> you know how that works too, the railroad. So. Uh, this is a mill that you may have seen, but you would not recognize it. This is, uh, this is Vaughn's Mill in Indian Valley. And if you drive down there, you can see part of that window right there. And you can see some of those boards, but the rest of it's been covered up by extensions, by additions to the mill. And that, was, that mill was built about 1901 or two, something like that. And it was the very last commercial mill to operate. Mabry Mill is operating, but it's not a commercial mill. And uh, if it was a commercial mill, it, 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 it would be gone because it, wouldn't, it couldn't support itself. Uh, Gene is here. Gene is the owner of that mill. And I asked him as we came in, what year did you uh, finally close the doors? And he couldn't, he couldn't remember exactly. And that quickly, it's only been it's less than five years, I think. Is that right, Gene? Fewer than five? I think it was around 2007 or 8 that it was last. Oh, you think? Gosh, time's gone. Rip Van Winkle, I've been sleeping for 10 years or something. At any rate, it's the very last. It's the very last that go, and this, the line of this goes back not just to the beginning of Floyd County, this goes back to the beginning of civilization. As soon as people settled down and began to grow grain, they had to mill it. So milling is a really, really uh, old and necessary profession. Uh, so that mill is still there. Gene is keeping the building in good shape, but um, that's hard to do because it's not generating any income. You're just paying taxes on it. And mills are necessarily built by streams. They're, you know, they're not great to turn into other property uh, because of the, the threat of, of flooding. But, uh, but there it is. And um, my grandmother's in that picture. This fella here, that's Reed, Reed Phillips. He and uh, a couple of other people built that mill. That's my, let's see, that's my great-grandfather. And uh, the last one in Floyd County. Uh, this was a Willis Mill in uh, just out uh, Firehouse Road in Willis. That water wheel, do you know where that wheel went to, Gene? Is that, that's not, that wheel didn't go to Vaughn's, did it? No. Okay. Did y'all get anything from that mill, the Willis Mill? Okay, I, that wheel w was sold and went somewhere, but I've forgotten where. Where it's, If you see it rolling up and down 221, you'll know where, this, where, where it came from. Uh, this is at the other end. This is uh, Poff Mill. If you go down through Check and you, at the post office in that country store, look across the road, you'll see a 12-foot water wheel. That's all that's left right there in the, in the field. And it was in uh, between two buildings. Mr. Johnson Poff was a very... Um, industrious fellow. He had a grain mill. He also had a, uh, a furniture a building and made furniture and they, they made coffins. They supplied coffins for people down there. He was a colorful, interesting character and uh, in the book I've got a quotation uh, from uh, a woman I think who I forget what her connection was but she said that she when she was a little girl she and they were poor, and she said she remembered often wishing she could be Johnson Pop's dog, because she said his dog lived better than they did. <laughs> and, uh, but he, he was a colorful, interesting fellow. There's a story or two about him that I didn't put in the book, but uh, if, I'll tell it to you if you, don't, if you don't record it or anything. No, I won't tell it to you all. I'll tell it to one of you at a time, but uh, it's kind of a funny story. Uh, C.W. Harmon Mill, different C.W. Harmon. This is on West Fork. If you go down um, Laurel Branch Road, down that dip and cross West Fork, look upstream, 
And uh, some of the abutments of the mill dam up there, that one washed away in the 19, about 1942 or something like that. A sudden cloudburst, uh, the dam, uh, you see it collapsed part of the dam and undercut the, the mill. The mill fell into the stream and the millstones were washed uh, several hundred yards down the stream. And those things weighed like two tons. So it was quite a, quite a flood there. And I, uh, it's in the book, I've forgotten that the book was finished in 2010, but parts of that mill were washed uh, miles down the stream. And I got an email from a man named Mr. Connor, I can't remember his name or where he lives, but he said when he was growing up in the 60s, part of the floor of that mill was still laying up on the bank of West Fork, uh, near where he lived, way on down uh, on Laurel Branch. Uh, would it be Laurel Branch? I've, I've forgotten now, but... West Fork, yeah, yeah, yeah. On, and uh, he lived on, um, I guess, Laurel Branch Road. This is Flint Mill still standing. It's a lot to say about that, but I know I'm, I've got to hurry along here. Uh, Flint Mill is like several others. It was built on the site of a flour mill. It's a corn mill that was built on the site of a flour mill. By the 30s, people, the writing was on the wall. No flour mills were built after, after 1925 but people were still uh, building some of the small corn mills and because there was already a dam and a race and a proven water power site, they might put up a small mill like that. And I can think of two or three, three that, that did that. Uh, if that mill that was on um, Jack's Mill Road, some of you from the other end of the, check end of the county, Jack's Mill Road before you get into Roanoke County, uh, Jack's mill has collapsed, the wheel is still there. It was, it's a small mill that was built on the side of a bigger flour mill, like Flint Mill. Um, there's a chapter in the book about this, I won't say much about it today, but uh, those smaller mills, many of them were supplanted by people, individuals who would buy a small uh, wooden self-contained mill and grind their own corn. And again, people who were who needed uh, excess quantities of cornmeal would buy those. And uh, people would put them up in a, in a building like this. This was built by my grandfather in the 30s. And um, he ground one day a week for his neighbors. And then the excess corn he could keep and he didn't have to grow his corn. Whether, whether uh, he, he had only one leg, he'd lost a leg in the mine, so he was getting his supply of cornmeal uh, without having to put out a field of corn. I call this liar's bench there because um, uh, when my grandfather died in 1939, his oldest son, my uncle Marvin, took over running the mill until they sold it. And he said he, uh, he had quit school and, and ran the mill one day a week. And he said he hated to do it because uh, all the men who came there, would. he said even if they didn't have corn, they would come and sit and tell lies. <laughs> And he, he said he didn't have any trouble with people telling lies, but they told the same lies, he said. <laughs> week after week after week. Uh, Spangler Mill, uh, another social aspect, uh, those big mills typically, or, or I won't say typically, but sometimes had a way, there was a, 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 a door or something in the face of the mill that the mill could be drained because they'll fill up with silt. Uh, or need repair. So you could drain the mill and then you would have a community fish fry. So you, there'd be a bunch of fish and turtles and things like that stranded. And um, uh, I'll point out a detail here. That little shed room on the back there, that's the turbine house because this, this mill, uh, the original miller had a water wheel, but this one had a turbine installed in about 1914 and uh, built a dam right at the mill. Originally the dam for this mill was further up the creek and it had a race, but turbines tended to be built uh, right by there. And I realize I'm getting into a technical thing that's, you won't be able to picture so much in your time with that, but look at the people assembled on the banks here. Well, you can't see what I'm pointing at, can you? There, people there, people here, and I always get a kick out of this little boy here. I don't know what he's looking for, something there. Uh, the biggest fish, I guess. Or, uh, and there's a date on that picture that I've never been able to, dis to make out the year, but there was a write-up in the Floyd Press about a fish fry at Spangler Mill, I think in 1911. 
And uh, they just gave it a glowing review, and they said that no one had got drunk and there weren't any fights. And uh, it was just a really good time for everybody. And uh, so again, a mill was a community center, uh, socially because everybody had to go, and also economically because they tended to attract other businesses. Uh, as I said, blacksmiths, post offices, um, and stores would uh, spring up around those. It was, you know, it was kind of one-stop shopping there. It was your 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 early days Walmart. And uh, if we if we ever went back to that, I'm sure, you know. Kroger's got a gas station now. Walmart had put up a little mill in the back, and you can take your <laughs> take your corn and get it ground right there. Uh, recreation uh, mill ponds certainly attracted people. Today, they're what a lawyer would call a uh, an attractive nuisance. I guess that's what. That, and uh, you know, I'm thinking about, my wife probably would call me that, wouldn't she? She, she said because she thought I was attractive, and that turned out to be a nuisance. Then. <laughs> Um, but it's a natural place to fish. Um, I, to me, I don't see how he has any hope of catching. That, that, that place is in flood, but he's optimistic, I guess. Uh, and they were dangerous. People drowned uh, in mill ponds. And um, I talked, I made a little joke about Mabry Mill a while ago. I, I, sometimes I say, a pond, no miller would have put a non-functioning pond because that's just a place to drown your neighbor's children. That's not any good. And, um, and, uh, but they certainly were dangerous. Accidental drownings happened there, and uh, several suicides were recorded, and uh, that some of them are in the, in the book there. And of course, they were a source of flooding if the dam ever broke, too. Uh, swimming. I guess you could call that swimming. Uh, it, it, with that much clothes on, I guess you'd never come up if you actually submerged yourself. Um, this is the picture that I mentioned to you. Look in the background. Those were fields of corn, and uh, they do not look like fields of corn. Those fields were intensively cultivated. There's not a weed on that whole place, but there's not really much corn on it because of the, you can't, you can't, because of the fertility of the ground, you can't plant it with the density that we have today. I think I told you that uh, if you look at an agricultural census of 19, 20s, fertilizer began to come, the, these nitrate fertilizers were around in the 30s, but nobody can pay for them. You know, we had, we had huge, we had hundreds, thousands of tons of nitrates left over at the end of World War I, which you know, we're at the 100th anniversary of that. So there were, what can we do with all these nitrates? How, you know, how much stuff can we blow up? We don't, we don't need to. So it goes in the fertilizer, it's the same stuff. You've heard of people, uh, terrorist acts, where they take fertilizer and diesel fuel. Fertilizer in the right hands is explosive. It's got, and these, these nitrates make things grow also. So they didn't have that yet. So uh, these are cornfields, but they look almost like, well, they just don't look like a modern cornfield because they're just not very thickly planted. So they planted every available acre in corn. And I bet you a dollar they'd been hoeing corn when they got in the creek right there. Probably going back when it's over with. Just cooling their feet off a little bit. Uh, recreation, uh, there was some skating, but uh, people on my end of the county didn't, uh, unless they, they didn't have, couldn't afford the skates, uh, they'd just get out and scoot around on the pond a little bit. And um, this is um, uh, what it says, Greasy Creek School. This is the entire female student body of Greasy Creek School uh, on Myrick Fort Creek in 1943. Uh, that's at Vaughn's Mill. Vaughn's Mill is still standing, as we know, but the dam is long gone. And that wooden race you see in the background from moving from the center of the dam over to the bank, all that's gone. The boys, I guess they were up at the top uh, skating on the pond, doing something more dangerous, maybe. And uh, these are skaters. This is, on the, this is on the wealthy end of the county. That's down in Copper Hill. And uh, Frank Webb came up with this uh, photograph. And I, I think these were people he knew and grew up with in Roanoke. And Frank told me this, and I, I no one's ever contested it, but he's, and I mean, who could ask? Frank said that before Irvin Huff would let anybody skate on his mill pond, he would drive his car out onto the pond to make absolutely sure that it would bear their weight. But my feeling is, what if he got a little too optimistic about that? And they, he drove it out there maybe a week too early. I mean, that's a pretty severe test, isn't it? Like, well, it's not ready. Guess I'll have to get another car. Or, or you know, I'll get this one out next spring sometime. But, uh, but it's interesting, and you can see, uh, this is an interesting, it's a delightful picture, but it's interesting too because you can see the expanse of that 
pond. And uh, some of you probably have ponds, but when you build a pond in a, in a valley like this, it's interesting how quickly that thing expands. And see, if you're using a mill pond with, a, with an open race, you can't take water off the bottom of that pond because as soon as it gets out into your race, it, it'll, you know, it's gonna rise up to its original, it's gonna overflow the race, only with a pipe. So you have to build a pond with the biggest area because you can only draw the top two or three feet off of that pond. So if you get several acres on the top, that's where your, your water comes from. So they would you know, try to expand the dam like that. And there's a lot to be said about that too, but not today, because you gotta go down to the Historical Society Museum. Uh, Mill ponds are really good for um, uh, photographs. There's a background. Some of the best evidence we have of them, memories of them, are, are as photographs. Because, not because someone said, hey, let's take a picture of that mill pond. They said, let's take a picture of our soldiers in front of the mill pond. It's an interesting background. So we're thankful for that. And I dare say that's the same way with churches and stores that we've lost. And no one thought about that's going to be gone one day. They took a picture of people the congregation. So, uh, and I was thinking as Becky was talking about these wonderful calendars, um, and you all, you have a store calendar, don't you? Uh, looking for a historical. Yeah. Uh, someone ought to do a book on the stores because, um, and f well, I started to say something kind of mean there. I'll say it anyway. The, the stories that come out of stores are generally more interesting than the stories that come out of churches, I guess is what I want to say. Yeah. Um, the, the, the church stories are probably more helpful and instructive to us, but the, the, the store stories are more entertaining, probably. So um, you got to have a story, you know, you got to have a little bit of a narrative to, to really sell anything. But uh, a picture of all, a book of all those old country stores would be, would be delightful. This picture, you can see it's dated in 1955. And when I first got this picture, I assumed that these men were just back from the war. I thought it was 1945, and I looked at the way their uniforms fit, and I thought, they got along better in that war than a lot of other people did. Uh, they're a little bit uh, tight under the arms there. So then I went back to the person who gave me the picture, and she said, no, she said this was Veterans Day, uh, 1955. So they did pretty darn good to fit into those uniforms. Ten years later, this is Willie Showalter on the on your left. Willie Showalter was a mailman in Indian Valley for years and years. A fine, fine fella. In the center is his brother-in-law, Arby Harris, and Arby was married to my dad's sister. He ran the um, Greasy Creek Mill, Harris Mill, still standing. He ran that for about 20 years. And then to his left is his brother Marvin. They were Harris's also. And in the background is the mill dam. And uh, the wooden portion of that dam is gone, but it was one of the last dams, large dams built in Floyd County. It has concrete abutments. The abutments are still there, and you, if you got a couple million dollars you don't need, go down there and buy that thing, put the mill back up, and, uh, and you won't have your couple million dollars anymore. <laughs> but, but you'll have a cool place to take pictures, I guess. That's what it would boils down to. But uh, thankfully, they, so you see the water coming over the top, and you can see a little of the concrete, concrete, uh, concrete abutment. And that mill used a pipe. There's a pipe is still in place to feed a turbine, so it was the most modern mill, uh, but it was it's the last flour mill built in Floyd County. Uh, again, a good picturesque space. Fifteen slides ago, you saw Flint Mill with the crowd in front and the little boy with the shotgun. This mill was uh, there before Flint Mill. This was the Vest Mill. It's on exactly the same spot, used the same dam, used the same race. And um, one interesting thing, if you've ever tried to locate something, um, something in an old picture, tried to see how that fit into the landscape, I'm always amazed at how hard that is to do. Those old cameras, maybe they had uh, the lenses that were wide angle or something and they distorted spaces that look huge in an old photograph look like your backyard in reality but one thing about this this big rock that this girl sitting on that rock is still there nobody's carried that rock off yet so uh, but if they do let them have it um, but it's it's you can locate that mill and of course the new mill was built on exactly the same spot so that's where Flint mill is on Beaver Dam Creek 
the water wheel, all that stuff was done away with. And uh, Benny Connor just passed away, a real good uh, guy from down in the Czech area, Copper Hill, Locust Grove, I guess. His father bought that and turned it into a dairy barn in the, in the 40s, I think in the early 40s. Same mill, uh, different women up on the water wheel there, and you can see it's a wooden, wooden water wheel. You get a sense of that, and um, that's enough to say about that. Uh, some Millers. This is the famous uh, Caleb Sowers of Sowers Mill, Sowers Mill Dam. And uh, throughout my life, the, all the cool kids from the other side of the county talked about Sowers Mill Dam. Sowers Mill was long gone. It burned in, the, in 1914, but the dam was still there. The concrete dam, the biggest concrete dam ever built in the county. The dam was intact until, I've forgotten the date, but uh, right after, I think 1948, uh, a young man drowned in Sowers, in the mill pond there. And uh, the Christiansburg Rescue Squad, newly formed, came out. Frank Shelton, who was a charter member, Frank was a camera guy, and he got up on the hill above Cyrus Mill Dam and recorded the explosion. They breached the dam to lower the water level so they could recover the body of this young man who had drowned. And Frank said either, he said there was a miscalculation. He said either they, either they, either he didn't park his car far enough away or they used too much dynamite. <laughs> and uh, he said he had a brand new 48 Plymouth. This is what, you know, well, the, none of you remember, and certainly I don't, but you've heard people say that you could not get a new car after World War II. Uh, I mean, you had to be somebody pretty powerful to do that. And uh, he finally got a new 1948 Plymouth, <laughs> and he said the chunks of concrete came raining down, and he had to get a new trunk lid, and uh, I think the windows are all okay. But um, So that dam was breached. I've been through that thing in a canoe. You can, you know, you can do that today, go through that hole, which was made in the early, about 1948, I guess. Uh, you ought to know that um, Sowers Mill Dam uh, served Sowers Mill, uh, but it was rebuilt in the 20s as the first and only uh, municipal power plant in Floyd County. They uh, made, it was the Florida Electric Company. It was chartered in the teens. They never got the thing going until about 21. And then it was, uh, bought by AVCO in 1936 and they you know, took, took everything out. But there's still a concrete base where they had the turbines. So if you, if you see that spot and see those concrete foundations there, they were not for the mill. They were for a powerhouse. That, uh, and they didn't serve anybody down there. The power came to Floyd. That's where, you know, that's where the power is at in Floyd. So that's where you send the power to. And uh, they were, initially they were closed on Sunday. They didn't have, serve any, have any power on Sunday. and then, eventually became 24-7, uh, but the joke was that if, a, if, they would say, if, the, if the lights blinked in Floyd, someone would say a fish had gone over the dam at Sowers Mill. So, it, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like we have today, but it was, it was progress. So, and there were several mills that made uh, small amounts of DC electric power. This was AC power, I guess, but uh, the DC power, you know, is like a car generator makes, and you don't you don't have to regulate it like you do with AC. You've got to have that 115 or 220 or whatever it is. So the, the DC would just kind of go up and down and people would make a little power at night uh, or run a few light bulbs on a radio or something like that And uh, after the mill shut down. But uh, there were only a few of those. Uh, this was William Allen Simpson. He, uh, the oldest mill still standing in Floyd County was his. It's on gold. Gold something road down uh, Gold Field Road. There you go. Yes, sir. That's exactly. And it's still there, and it's sort of perilous looking. And I, I, I'm afraid nothing's going to be done for that, and it's going to be gone. Uh, but he, by all accounts, was a wonderful old man. Effie Brown was his niece, and she said he was uh, just a fine man. He was 20 years. His wife, you see, on the left, he was he was 20 years older than her. But it, those years, it looks like were harder on her than they were on him. She's catching up, I think. Um, that's his daughter behind and his grandson in front. And um, his will is a, a sad thing to read. Uh, he, he apparently was just a wonderful Christian man. And he, he believed in, uh, he said, you work like, um, well, how was it? He said, work like you'll live forever and live like your, today's your last day. 
and uh, his son, he had one son, his son uh, had uh, died in a, a mental asylum as a young man, and, um, and then he had a grandson, one grandson, and the grandson was killed in an automobile accident when he was about 16, so, so he didn't have anybody to pass the thing on to, and it, it closed uh, in, the, around the, in the early 40s, I think, but he's an example of the really interesting personalities. He was a Civil War veteran, as was Caleb Sowers, and if you look at the mills that were built 1870s, 1880s, frequently they were built by Civil War veterans, people who had been out and seen something of the world, and uh, got some ideas about how other people were, were doing things and learned that Floyd was not necessarily on the cutting edge of technology as we are today. Um, uh, there were people involved in mills who never owned one but who spent their lives in mills. This was uh, Clarence Wood and his father, whose name was Cricket Wood, uh, did own the Willis Mill but Clarence was just a miller. He never tried, maybe never had the money but he, he worked for people and ran mills, and often the little mills were almost always run by the man who owned it, by his, by a son or daughter, or even by the wife. Big mills were sometimes run by hired help because there's there's cash money in there. And uh, Clarence Wood was, and uh, it just came into my mind. I remember talking to um, to um, Arthur Bond, who lived in Indian Valley, and he said that Cricket Wood had told him about participating in a firing squad during the Civil War. He was compelled to be, um, you know, not on, I mean, he's told him the story, so you know which side he was on, on the firing squad, but, the, and I don't know if he got, he got someone to take his place or something, but that would be, that's not an experience that I, I've personally talked to anyone about, and that would certainly stay in your memory from now on. So, stories uncollected, that had nothing to do with milling, but just, I remembered it thinking about Cricket Wood, his name was Cricket. So he was the miller there, and uh, the guy who owned it was a fellow named Ed Strong. And the Strongs were, there were three brothers, very prominent, wealthy men, Ed, Flem, and Henry. And Henry was kind of a local banker. And I'll tell you this other quick story here uh, about Henry Strong. Um, I remember talking to three older folks, and just out of randomly, who told me about what happened when Henry Strong died. Uh, one person had money in the bank when Henry Strong died, and she and her brother, uh, two sisters and their husbands, they said, we'll buy that farm. And they did. Uh, another fellow that I talked to, Arthur Bond, he heard that Henry Strong had died. And he, the word went out that uh, anyone who owed Henry Strong money had to come and pay it right now. And uh, his brother was collecting on the notes. and. Uh, his brother said, I'm not taking no coffee poke receipts. Because Ed Strong apparently would write a receipt on whatever he had, and he would write them on coffee bags. And he said, I'm not taking no coffee bag receipts. And Arthur Vaughn told me that he said he, he had went to the Bank of Floyd or some bank and got a bank account and wrote a check, and he had a check, and he wasn't worried, like other people were, that he would have to pay that debt over. He had a valid receipt. He had a canceled check. The third person who told me about it was my uncle Monroe Gallimore, and uh, they didn't have uh, much at all. And he said they had borrowed uh, five dollars from Henry Strong, and they didn't have five dollars. They had paid it back, and they were looking for the receipt. And his, he said his mother went through. They had a bit, one of those big trunks, and they had all their papers in that trunk. And he said she went through that trunk, and she couldn't find it. And he said she sat down on the floor and cried. And he said, then she, he said she prayed about it and said she looked again and she found that receipt. And he could remember 80 years later how, how happy she was uh, when she found the receipt for $5. Interesting how different people view the same event there. Uh, this is one of the most interesting characters I ever came across. This is uh, Haile Moses. And uh, he was a, quite a character. He was an alcoholic. He was a, uh, and I wouldn't have put that in the book, but every person you talk to about Holly Moses said he was an alcoholic. He was immensely talented. He was the best millwright around. He built several mills. He ran several, but it never lasted very long. His wife, uh, and the fact that they're sitting about 15 feet apart is significant. 
Um, she, was a, she was a good miller too. Her father and grandfather were millers. His father and grandfather were millwrights. He had five, uh, he had nine brothers. Five of them were millwrights. Two of them were electricians. They went to, Ro they moved with his parents to Roanoke and suddenly found out, hey, there's not a lot of work for millwrights in Roanoke, Virginia, fixing water powered uh, mills. So they became electricians. So, uh, but his, he lived a tumultuous life with his poor wife. And uh, from every account, she was long suffering. And uh, when he would uh, have a bout of a binge of drinking, she would never say that to the customers. The customers, customers would come, and whatever little community happened to be nearest the mill he was working in, she would say, for instance, when they worked at Greasy Creek Mill, if he couldn't come to work, she would say, oh, he's gone to Willis. And uh, he worked at Webb's Mill, and she would say, oh, well, Mr. Moses has gone to Floyd. And people knew what she was saying. Um, and she would do the milling. And by, by I say all accounts, only a handful, she was a very skillful, competent miller and could, could run the mill. And there's a little section in the book about women in mills. Uh, there's, there's some evidence that a woman owned a mill, but I never could find a, a good deed on that. But certainly women ran mills and worked in mills, and she was one of them. You, you may ha not have noticed, but uh, one way to recognize a mill building is there usually is not a flu, because they were scared to death of fire. Uh, all that dry dust, uh, flour dust is actually explosive. And the story that I've heard is that if there was some small, exp and, and mills, You've got stones in there. If you get a piece of metal in that thing, spark. Uh, if you overheat one of those old bearings and get so, um, fire was a danger. So they wouldn't complicate it with lamps and, uh, and stoves. But occasionally they'd put one in the corner in an enclosed room, never out in the open. But the story is that uh, if there was a fire started, a, a little explo if there, if there would be an explosion, a small explosion, like a little poof, and that would jar loose these years of dust that are settled on everything, and then, and then when that explodes, that's that's kind of wrecks the thing. So a lot of Floyd County mills did burn up. Uh, the biggest mill it has a very interesting history. The man who built that mill disappeared with all the money from one of the banks in Floyd, and uh, and all his all fifty dollars he took with him, and uh, and the interest. So he. Uh, he, all his possessions were sold, and I, I'm not, I'm absolutely not trying to get you to buy a book. The book is in the library, but that, that story is in there too. And Marguerite Teich knew a lot about that. It was very, his name was Winfield uh, Scott. And uh, Scotts were a prominent family here in Floyd up until, up till after that, I guess. So, um, but, well, still, yeah. So, but anyway, I want to call your attention to the fact that um, Mr. Moses and his wife ran this meal also. But look at this picture here. Here they are. Now let me show you a little close-up on that there. There they are. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if we could read into that, but they, they, they uh, make out of that what you will. Uh, Cab Nolan was the last man to grind uh, in Floyd County with water power. He, he owned this, what we think of now as the Pine Creek Mill or um, the Sheeler Mill or Nolan Mill. Um, and he, all, he also owned um, Spangler, isn't that right, Judy? And uh, so I think in this, I never could get anybody to pin that down exactly, but I think we decided maybe the 70s sometime was when he ground with water the last time. Now, uh, Harry Robertson ground in the Robertson Mill after that, but he was using an electric, um, electric uh, motors. And of course, Gene Vaughn and Sammy Phillips were, were grinding into uh, you know, past the year 2000, but using diesel and electric power. So as far as turning a water wheel with water, transmitting that power into the building, producing edible uh, feed or, or animal feeds, whatever, uh, Cab Nolan, I believe, is the last guy to do that. Um, and that's his, that's his mill before Philip Gettle rebuilt the race, which came around here, made a, not a right, turned but a couple of angles and turned and went on to the wheel. And this is interesting to note that the wheel turns backward on this one. Uh, the, the, this wheel was bought in North Carolina and brought in and it was too tall to use in the original configuration. So 
So the race actually hits it right about here, at about this level. So, so you can't, you know, you can't turn it over. So you, the water comes on and then it turns the wheel that way. And that's, that's actually, there's some uh, mechanical advantages to that, but the, they had to do that. And it's called a, a pitchback wheel, but it's, uh, there was that one and there was one other one in the county that I know of, pitchback wheel. Uh, the liquor trade is, is, is mixed up. You can't separate it. Uh, I tried not to romanticize it because there's a, there's a lot of misery. Uh, it makes a good movie, but not a much of a home life with, uh, with liquor and that sort of thing. So, uh, but it was there. This was, ad was from the Floyd, uh, I forget what paper it's from. Um, I didn't copy the caption as well, but uh, something to drink and where to get it. Uh, pure apple brandy, corn and rye whiskey at Henry Boards, Flint, Virginia. And the fine print says, I have whiskey on hand from one to four years old. Um, and the best old brand, all orders by mail or otherwise will receive prompt attention. Now, can you picture that? You can put a stamp on a letter and get liquor in the mail like that. It's not liquor by the drink. That's liquor by the envelope or something like that. Um, satisfaction guaranteed. The patronage of the public is solicited. There were absolutely several... Um, licensed distilleries in Floyd County and um, pre-prohibition and there were lots of uh, unlicensed ones uh, after that. Oops, I backed up here. Uh, the prohibition movement is, is, is uh, documented in local newspapers just like it was all over the, the United States. Um, the the people who were for the liquor were generally silent. They just sort of patted their pocketbooks and went on. And the people who were against it uh, were vocal in uh, pulpits and also uh, with uh, you know the, through the medium of newspapers. And I'll read this to you. Uh, old Rye speech. I was made to be eaten and not to be drank. To be threshed in a barn, not soaked in a tank. I come as a blessing when put through a mill, as a blight and a curse when run through a steel. Make me into loaves, and your children are fed, but if into drink, I will starve them instead. In bread, I'm a servant, the eater shall rule. In drink, I am a master, I am master, the drinker, a fool. Then remember the warning, my strength I'll employ, if eaten to strengthen, if drank to destroy. Um, so rye was uh, a, a common, but not too much rye flour. Uh, you don't hear much talk about rye bread. Harry, Harry Robertson. Uh, <coughs> Wonderful memory, wonderful guy. Harry told me that his father did grind rye and they occasionally had rye biscuits. And he said they made beautiful golden biscuits. And he said, and they were good when they were hot. He said, but afterward, not so much. He, so I never had a biscuit made out of rye, but apparently they're pretty, but not too tasty. I guess they don't go with sausage gravy or something like that. Uh, a few other uh, industries attached to that. Um, Saw milling, the, the first sawmills in Floyd County were run by water wheels up until 1910, something like that. Any, virtually every mill had a sawmill attached to it. And in fact, the sawmill would often be there first to saw the lumber to build the mill. Uh, this one is in the 1930s. Uh, I would not be surprised to, to find out that the man who built this, uh, put this, was trying to help his neighbors have something to do. Uh, because uh, steam engines are a much more efficient way to saw lumber. Steam engines came in in the teens, good times. Uh, the teens were economically good in Floyd County. Portable steam engines, you pull the engine into the woods and then you pull the logs to the mill, saw them, haul the lumber away. A lot less labor intensive than it is to pull the logs all the way down to a stream somewhere and have them sawed at the sawmill. But this one, uh, this picture, uh, you can see there, got plenty of help there. This, uh, this guy, the backhander, he's rolling the logs on. And here's, this is the sawyer, and his left hand is pulling a stick, and that's called the money stick. And if you're, that, cause that's where the money's made. If you're a good sawyer, you don't waste a lot of lumber, you make money. If you put all your money in a slab pile, you're not gonna make money. The good joke, I gotta tell you this joke, is a good joke for you, I know you're, you, everybody likes a good joke. Hope it's a good, you know, it's always dangerous to say it's a good joke. And I hope it's a good joke. Anyway, this guy's a sawyer. He's running a sawmill. 
And uh, if you've ever worked at a sawmill or know anything about a sawmill, you know that that big sawmill, that saw 40 to 50 inches in diameter, that thing is limber. And uh, you have to spin it at a high speed and the centrifugal force makes it stand up stiff. But if it gets too hot, it will warp. Or if you can't get it up to speed, it'll do that. And you'll have to hammer it. But before you hammer it, before you get that desperate, you've got these little wooden guides on each side. So here's that big saw plate. And you've got little wooden guides, a pin on each side and with screws. And you can screw those, screw those guides in until they almost touch the side of that saw. And that'll keep it from wobbling at the point where it's going into the log. And that's down below the deck. So the log is right here. But the, the bad part about that is you've got to adjust them while the saw is running. If, if, if the saw has got any flip to it or any uh, warp to it, if you adjust them while it's sitting still, you might push the whole thing sideways. So the sawyer, he reached in there with his uh, wrench. He's just trying to adjust those, and he leaned in there just a little too far. And, uh, and he sawed his ear off. And he, uh, so he stopped the saw and he said, boys, he said, I've sawed my ear off. He said, would you help me find it? So they started looking, they, they looked under, you know, in the saw box right under there and couldn't find it. So this guy, or the guy back here with the slabs, he thought, well, maybe it's already in the sawdust pile. So he came back here, he climbed up, there's a little chain conveyor right here that drags sawdust to the top of this pile and it drops it. So he climbed up the sawdust pile and he dug around there in the top and just a few inches down, he found it, you know, and he picked it up and he, he, said, he said, is this it? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, the sawyer, looked, he said, no, mine had a pencil behind it. Yeah. <laughs> and that's not true, of course. But that's a pretty good story, so. All right, Molly, I know I need to hurry, I'm sorry, so. All right, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, gosh, what was his name? Mr. Dunn, his son was Angus Dunn. I forgot, William Dunn, maybe. He was, uh, I don't know where he's from, but he was an expert at setting up uh, woolen mill machinery. He was hired to come into uh, Burke's Fork up there uh, on just, just north of the Buffalo on, um, um, gosh, Cat Paul, not Paul, Vaughn, Vaughn land. There was a Vaughn, a Vaughn woolen mill that was built in the 1800s. And up until the middle of World War II, they made beautiful blankets and coverlets. And I had never seen one until the Old Church Gallery had an exhibit. And some of those blankets, the most beautifully dyed uh, wool blankets, and they, and they were, what, 80 years old, 70 years old. It must be as good as new. Here he's weaving a coverlet. You've seen the old hand-woven coverlets, but they're only about this wide, and you have to piece them together. These, these are like eight feet uh, to make you know, a full uh, bedspread or something like that. And that used water power, and they also had a corn grinding capacity there too. And there's a picture of the whole thing. And um, once again, you don't see any, um, any uh, flues in there because of dust and uh, lots of windows because to make that cloth and the spinning, you, you, it's, it's more necessary that you be able to see things very clearly. So, more windows than a typical um, water-powered mill. And I'm not just, um, as I look at this, I'm not certain that the, the corn mill might have been in the little building you see to the left there, possibly. And there's no sign of that today. Uh, this is Jean Vaughn's dad, Ephraim Vaughn. Uh, when people began to put in the roller mills, they needed more power. And uh, that, that's always a problem with, there's, a, there's an ir irony in Floyd County's water. We say we're well watered, we are, with surface water. Floyd County has lots of streams, we don't have many big streams. Well, the water starts here, so we don't have a, a big place to build a big dam, and a, and a, lar and a dam across a large stream is, is problematic anyway. So uh, as the milling business grew, they needed more power than the water wheel could provide. So he's built a platform, he's got a Fordson tractor on there, and that is powering the flour mill on the top floor. And then the water wheel could be flouring the, the stones to grind uh, corn. And didn't they grind buckwheat at one time, Gene, also? Yeah, before my oh, even before his, yeah. That's a whole story, buckwheat. And uh, talk to Howard Dickerson down in Willis. Uh, if you're into buckwheat, uh, you may be in luck, because Howard, Howard grew seven acres of buckwheat this year. That's a lot of buckwheat. And um, I'll give you a little note on that. In 1939, Floyd County and Carroll County, the 
adjacent counties of Virginia, together they grew half of the buckwheat grown in the entire state of Virginia. And uh, as far as I know, there's nothing alcoholic you can make out of buckwheat. So somebody was eating a lot of buckwheat. And it's kind of a trendy thing, you know. There's no gluten in it, and uh, it's got all these magical properties, I guess. And uh, so buckwheat may come back. And the buckwheats are kind of, buckwheat cakes are kind of an acquired taste, but, they, uh, but they're good, and they stick to your ribs. So you may look into that. Uh, this is uh, a Weddell, Wickham, Boyd, Webb, A.G. Mill. That picture is more significant to you if I show you this picture. No, no, I don't. I started to say it's, it's the picture on the cover of the book, but it's the same picture. What I want to show you is a picture of the mill there. That's the same mill. That's in the 30s. And there it is in the 50s. So what this illustrates is the fact that once these mills were abandoned, they do not last long because they're, they're 10 feet from a stream. They're in a low-lying area. They're damp all the time. They're susceptible to flooding. In use, they're susceptible to fire, but once they're abandoned, they, they're not useful to convert to anything else because the, the internal structure of them and uh, they just, unless someone like Gene uh, spends money that they may or may not have to uh, deliberately keep them up, then they, they typically don't last very long. Uh, this was the only mill built in Florida that was completely electric powered. That was right across the street from uh, the country store. And um, Freeman Cockrum and his brothers, they owned it. They used it for storage, or maybe they leased it. And it was a furniture store. When I was uh, in high school, it was a used furniture store. And uh, that was built as an electric powered mill sometime, I think, in the 30s. There, were, there was one steam powered mill in Floyd County out near the parkway. Uh, this is Spangler Mill, um, the one that blew down, I think, 2005 or something like that. And uh, it's, the roof got bad. When the roof gets bad, the floor gets bad. When the floor gets bad, the timbers get bad. And when you get one, just get one corner, just get it doing that, it's, it's beyond repair. And uh, that's what happened to it. The works of that mill, by the way, most of them, some of them are in uh, Meriden, Kansas, in a reconstructed mill. So they've been restored and still at work. Uh, this is Sammy Phillips, is, uh, my dad's first cousin. He and Gene Vaughn here were partners for years in Vaughn's Mill in Indian Valley. Sammy and his son bought a mill in North Carolina and still run it. Sammy is 94, still in pretty good shape. And there we are picking up the last remains of that mill. There's nothing but a pile of rubble there and a few rocks in the creek to show you where the mill was at, the Spangler Mill. Um, Becky, where's Becky? How much, how much time do we have, Becky? Just keep going. Keep going, okay. <laughs> well, if they leave, if I keep them five more minutes, they'll have to stop at the History Museum. Then. It's 11.46. We'll be done by noon here. Uh, this is too small for you to read, but it's in here for a reason. This is the typescript of one of the mill entries on the, the, the mill that was initially built by Peter Grant and uh, then replaced with another mill. But what I wanted to show you about this, is, there's two things about this. One is the difficulty of assigning a name to a mill. Now, uh, Vaughn's Mill, which uh, Gene Vaughn here still owns, it's pretty easy, pardon me, to name that, because his dad bought that mill in the, in the 30s, maybe, Gene? There you go. His dad bought that mill and ran it as long until his retirement in the 60s, maybe? There you go. And then Gene and uh, his, his first cousin ran it. And then Sammy went to North Carolina. Gene ran it until it closed. And you're still running Vaughn's Mill as a, a distribution center there. Yeah. Yeah. So the name is still there. Easy to put a name on that. But some of these mills changed hands every two or three years. So what I want to show you with this, I'm just going to show you the list of the deeds. And I'll read to you the years. And it's, it's an extreme. Obviously, I picked the one that really illustrates it, but it's not, uh, it's atypical, but it's not unique in uh, having changed hands so many times. So what it illustrates to me is people's mistaken assumption that a mill would be an easy place to make a living. 
I'll just sit down and grind stuff and let these other let the farmers do all the work. But I don't think it apparently didn't happen that way. The second thing, so the two things about it. One is that mills changed hands frequently. Many mills did. The second is that there's no logic to the names that they have. This guy, John O. Jack, he owned the mill sometime in the 1800s. After he sold it, years later it was torn down and they built another mill there and they called it Jack's Mill. And they call it Jack's Mill Road today. So it's so if, if you recognize the mill that's in the book or you saw it on screen and you know it by a different name, that's, that's not a surprise. People sometimes call the mill by the name that if, if some family member worked there or they say, well, that's dad's mill. One, this one lady told me, well, that was dad's mill. And I looked a long time and I figured out that her dad had been like a, a third partner or something. Um, so people might magnify the roles of their family in the same way that we do anything that our family does. That's what's important to us. So hard to, hard to assign the best name to mills. So you saw one a while ago, I call it the, the uh, Weddle, Wickham, Webb, AG mill. It is for the four most prominent owners. So I'll show you the next page here. Um, there we go. There's the deeds. And I'll just read the years t to you on that. Uh, 1870, 1866, that was a late recorded deed. 1872, 1878, 1881, 1994, 1910, 1910, 1911, 1912, 1913, 1913, 1916, 1919, 1921, 1926, 1935, and then by 1958, it was, it was probably closed. But that thing, it changed hands. The only people who was making any money was lawyers, uh, which, which may not surprise anybody. I don't know. But uh, that's where the money was to be made. And many mills, the large ones, were foreclosed on. They were going into receivership, and they were sold at commission or sales. So lots of, the bigger mills, more risk, and... Um, as you can see, lots of times people didn't, it didn't turn out to be the gold mine that maybe they thought it, it would be. Uh, what's left of the mills? We got some memorabilia. This is a calendar from, uh, from Webb's mill, Oscar Ames Webb and Son. Um, he bought it in the 20s. And um, for years I didn't, he had a silent partner or, or a partner who was an inactive partner and it was just as J.A. Harmon. I didn't know who that was, and Chris Harmon Jr. called me, I guess he's Jr., called me a year or two ago and said that, Je that was Dr. Jabez Harmon, the, the doctor who was the father of Chris Harmon, the veterinarian. He said he, and, it, and if you look at any of these mills, who was partners and who they sold it to, it's almost always, it's a niece or a nephew or a cousin or a brother-in-law. Unless it was at an auction where anybody can buy it, they tried to keep them in the family. So I ended up doing a lot of genealogy. And uh, and I, I want and Frank did a lot of I don't want to dis, uh, dismiss that too, uh, but in in trying to sort out some of the tangles in the deeds, we we found lots of family connections that the last names might be different, but you go back a generation or two and they're they're related somehow. Uh, millstones these lay by the side of the road uh, at the Carroll and Floyd County line for years when I was young. Somebody's family carried them off. Uh, stones don't rust, stones don't rot, and they're, they're still around, so they're a collectible thing. Once again, you never see anybody with a, an old roller mill laying around looking romantic, but uh, the stones do. Uh, this is Vaughn's Mill as it looks, pretty much as it looks today. I told you you could see that window, I told you a lie, you can't even see the window. But uh, here's some of the original siding of that mill from 1903, and then all this 1950s maybe, Gene, this addition on the side, I think you told me you were in the uh, Army or something, or had come back from the Army? It was in the early 50s. Early 50s, okay, that's before you were in the Army maybe. Right. Yeah, you told me some story about it, uh, about a car or some tire, car tires or something, what was uh, Yeah, so 50 model Ford car. Yeah, and you had a 50 model Ford car? Yeah. The there you go, yeah. And uh, the stories about these, I was so lucky, and Frank and I were so lucky that uh, Gene was able to talk about this and Sammy could take us, Sammy could take us back to the, 
to the 30s on that meal. Uh, but many of them, all you have are deeds. So uh, get the stories if you, if you can, because that's what makes them interesting. This, no, that would be, that's a cyclone, that's a dust collector. You know, th this wasn't one of the meals that, uh, that, that we're doing it. No, 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 that's, uh, well, see, you'd, you'd burn your meal down, you see, so that wouldn't be too good. But, uh, but um, well, who knows? I mean, if someone says grind this corn, you don't, you don't ask him what he's going to do with it. So uh, I met a guy at a, at a meal uh, meeting in the, up in, the, in Herndon one time. He was from Kentucky, and he had a little mill uh, he ground for his neighbors. And he said two strangers came in one day um, and said they were kind of overalls and everything and didn't have too much to say. And he said they had a, eight, a Chevrolet pickup with an eight-foot bed just heaped up with yellow corn. And it had snow on it. And he said, he said when you get this uh, mill home, he said it may not keep too long. It's a little bit wet. And they said, that's okay. We don't, we're not worried about it. And he said, well... Just uh, out of curiosity, he said, what are you gonna do with all that corn? And uh, he said they kind of looked at each other, they looked at him, and one of them said, big family. <laughs> and, and he said, you didn't ask them any more questions. But, uh, but this, is, uh, this is the last one, and uh, it's um, progress, you know, time moves on. This was uh, old Compy Nestor. I've got him in there because you can see what these small Meadows mills look like. They were really common. And I'll give you a little map here and show you how popular they were at one time. This is not a great picture, but uh, say 1912, the blue dots are water-powered mills in roughly Indian Valley. The red dots, they are those small mills that are relatively portable, and they would be powered by, at that time, probably an old car motor or a steam engine. By the 30s and four, by the 40s, 50s, they they're powered by electric motors. But uh, so this is 1912. Now look at the next picture. This is uh, say 19. It's 25 to 1940. So let's say 1935, right in the middle. The blue dots are water-powered mills. The red dots are portable mills powered by steam or gasoline engines. And they were they were more common than schoolhouses even. They just dotted the countryside and. Um, I've got six of those things, but there must be a bunch more around here somewhere. And uh, they typically bred. They've got a hopper on the top. It's got vertical stones inside, and they produce cornmeal much faster than the old type mill. So now here's 1960. Uh, the blue, two blue dots are still there, and uh, even they are not being powered by water, but they still have the water wheels on them. One of those genes mill. And uh, I'm, I'm thinking, the wa I think Sammy said about 1959 or something like that was the end of water milling at your mill. Does that sound right? Yeah, I think Pretty close to it. Yeah, it just couldn't. It, it was too much maintenance. There was not enough water. Not enough yeah, diesel is convenient. You had a diesel unit in the basement to, to make feed and so on. They had electric motors and that's just... It just couldn't keep up. It just couldn't do the job anymore. Plus, you, you know, it's up and down with rain. You got to maintain the dam and, and all those other jobs. Uh, this is a list of the mills that were still standing in 2010. Um, and they are uh, Robertson Mill on Dodd Creek. It's still there, but it's, it's the most interesting mill in the county in terms of being still... Uh, uh, has machinery still in it, and that machinery is 19th century machinery. That mill was never modernized. It's really the most interesting mill. The Nolan Pine Creek Mill, uh, and Nolan, that's, uh, that's Judy Hilton's, Nolan Hilton's family. This is, uh, uh, was built by Sheelers. It's still there. It's probably in the best shape, uh, uh, it and Vaughn's. Um, this Poff Mill, I don't know. Frank said that it had been converted to a home, and he never showed it to me. I don't know where it's at. Uh, the Flint Mill on Beaver Dam Creek is in good shape. They keep a painted roof, but all the milling machinery is gone. The William Allen Simpson Mill, uh, we saw William and his wife and uh, daughter and grandson. That mill is still there. It's three stories, looks pretty, pretty rough. Uh, Ezra Wimmer Mill, uh, it's still there right on, um, I forget the name of that road, but 
It's, a, it's the only one with a shed roof. It doesn't have an A roof on it. Dodds Creek Mill, that's the one. Webb's Mill down on Route 8, it's leaning toward the, toward the creek. Vaughn's Mill is in operation in 2010. It's in good shape. Greasy Creek Mill's empty, fair to good condition. It still is. Uh, Mabry Mill, opening, operating good condition. George Sheeler Mill on Howe Creek, you can miss. That's the Huff Cannery building right there on 221, where you cannery road, Huff Can uh, So what's the name of that road? Canning Factory Road, yeah, there you go. Hard to identify that, but it was intended to be a mill, but it was never completed uh, as a mill. And then the Everly Mill on Dodge Creek, converted to residential and retail space, good condition, it's still in good. This mill, uh, Everly Mill and uh, Robertson Mill were built by the same man. So it's, it's, it's not surprising to me that they're both still standing. He was a master builder, blacksmith, uh, John Epperly, really interesting fellow. Uh, that's the epilogue, and I put that in there because I thought I would read that to you, but I think I won't. I'll just read you the last uh, paragraph, because you've, you've heard enough. It's time for us to move along here. Uh, this is the epilogue, the end of the whole thing. The Roman general who conquered ancient Carthage at the end of the Punic Wars is said to have commanded his soldiers to leave no stone stacked atop another. For the water-powered mills that served us so well for so long, the same job is being done more slowly and with less violence, but just as implacably by water, tree roots, frost, fire, and the occasional backhoe or bulldozer. Before it is too late to preserve the stories of these ruins, you, the reader, are urged to stop milling around Put your nose to the grindstone and set about getting what you can of this history in the sack. There'll be time enough later to separate the wheat from the chaff. Bear in mind that the mill cannot grind with the water that is passed. So that's our presentation. Thank you.